Hello again. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for joining me. Well, I quite often begin my sermons with a question and today is no exception. So my question for you this morning is this. Who is your favourite superhero? I thought I had grown out of superheroes when I stopped wearing short trousers to school, but now I find I have a flourishing crop of grandchildren and those Marvel and DC comic characters seem to be creeping back into my life. Maybe you're the same, and if so, who's your favourite? Is it Superman, the character deemed by most comic scholars to be the first true superhero? Cal L, to use his real name, was so powerful that only one thing can stop him. Deadly kryptonite. Although all that power doesn't seem to stop him wearing his underpants on the outside of his costume. Or do you prefer your hero to be a bit more down to earth? Someone like Batman, who has no superhuman powers, just a lot of money and a talent for creating formidable gadgets with which he can take on all comers. And underneath his dark brooding exterior lurks a dark, complex persona that only his butler Alfred truly understands. Or maybe Spider-Man is more your cup of tea. Peter Parker would have been just another ordinary schoolboy if he hadn't been bitten by a radioactive spider which conferred on him super strength and hyper awareness. And there are plenty of others to choose from. Wonder Woman, the Incredible Hulk, the Iron Man, Thor, Flash Gordon, the Green Lantern, I could go on and on. Whoever you like best, they all have a couple of things in common. They all encounter obstacles, dangers and setbacks. And they are all forces for good who must overcome evil at any cost. Well, if you're wondering what any of this has to do with our reading this week, the theme for the passage we're looking at in Romans today is overcoming evil with good. The passage is Romans chapter 12 verses 9 to 21 and in it we find the Apostle Paul telling the Roman church and by extension us Christians today to do exactly that, to overcome evil with good. Well, today I'm going to divide the passage into two sections. In the first part, verses 9 to 13, Paul is talking about how to deal with evil coming from believers, evil from within the church itself. And in the second part, verses 14 to 21, Paul is talking about how to deal with evil in the community, outside of the church, in the wider world. So let's jump in right away with the first point, which I'm calling the evil in here. The evil in here. We've been working through the book of Romans for some weeks now, and we've seen that one of the main reasons Paul wrote his letter was to tackle some division that was going on between the Gentile and the Jewish believers in the Roman church. The Roman church was what we might call nowadays a diverse church. That's a modern term and we all understand what it means, but back then they perhaps had a simpler perspective on the problem. It was all about us and them. Us, the Jewish believers whose ancestor was Abraham and who were claiming the blessings that were passed down from their great forefather. And them, the Gentile believers, who were boasting about being grafted into Christ as the new family of God. Who was right and who was wrong? Well, they were both right and they were both wrong. They both had a point, but they were going about making it in entirely the wrong way, in making their claims about who were the real Christians in all of this. Some of them, some of them were acting in a decidedly unchristian fashion. And so in the chapters leading up to the one we are looking at today, chapter 12, 
Paul spends a lot of time tackling the division between these groups, demolishing their arguments, showing them how to right the wrongs. And that's why here in chapter 12, he begins the chapter with one of his famous therefores. There's a connection here. Therefore, he says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is the passage that Barry was speaking on last week, the one where Paul patiently explains how we should live with Christ in us. And then, beginning with verse 9, he starts to deliver his final instructions on how to remedy what he calls the evil that has infected the church, what I'm calling the evil in here. So let's read this section. Romans 12 verses 9 to 13, and I've put the words up on the screen for you. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. These are marvellous words. This is what Tom Wright describes as a no-nonsense version of Christian living. A no-nonsense version of Christian living. Paul begins with an instruction, a command, to love with sincerity. And that means, as some other translations put it, to love without hypocrisy. Loving unhypocritically. What does that mean? Well, my Bible heads up this section with the words, love in action. In Paul's time and in Paul's mind, love was much more than just a vague, wishy-washy, sentimental feeling. It was more about what people did than what they felt. Pure and genuine love is not about pretending we care for someone and then going away and forgetting all about them. True love, as Elizabeth Shively puts it, is fervent, relentless and practical. In verse 9, the, Paul, the word Paul uses for love is agape. It's the fatherly love of God for humans and the love that we humans return to God. But in verse 10, be devoted to one another in love, Paul makes it more specific by using the word filio or filio. This is the family love that we see when people are living together in community. It's an active love, a practical love, and a love that is continuous as we continue in relationship with one another. And sometimes, I've got to admit, it seems more relentless than continuous. Continuous doesn't quite cut it. And that's because sometimes love can be sheer hard work, can't it? Moving on to the second part of verse 9. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Or as some translations put it, hate what is evil, stick fast to what is good. These are golden words. You really can't get any simpler or clearer than that. As Christians, we all know the difference between good and evil. So Paul says, don't waste time mulling these things over in your mind. See the evil, hate it, don't give it a further thought, but hold tight onto what is good. Don't let it go. Which brings us on to verse 10. And this time, let's look at the whole of verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. 
to really understand what Paul is getting at here, we need to remember that Paul is writing to two groups of believers who are divided, which makes his message a hard saying. It's a message that's hard for us to take on board. We naturally want to resist it. We want to say, well, this isn't for me. But what Paul is saying here is that we should not just love those people we choose to get along with, but also those we clash with, the ones who have opposite views from ours, the people who really know how to push our buttons. You see, it's not as simple as love the ones you love. It's love them all. Love the ones you love quite a bit less than the ones you really love. Love them all. How does our devotion to these people look? Could it be described as loving devotion, as sincere devotion? How do we honour those people above ourselves? Do we honour them to their faces? And then talk about them completely differently when we're with other people? This is a gravely serious point Paul is making to two groups of Christians who aren't getting along because he wants to tackle what he calls the evil in their midst. That's a strong word for what he's talking about, but it's a word that he uses with intent, with deliberateness. And when I think about this, I think of that phrase in the book of Ecclesiastes. There is nothing new under the sun. This is as important for us today as it's always been, to paraphrase that Hovis advert. This message is as good for you today as it's always been. A believer that we disagree with is still a believer. And the Apostle Paul commands us, be devoted to them. Honour them above yourselves. Really strong words. And they're not words to just read and forget. They are words to chew over, reflect on and deeply consider. So challenge yourself with the question, am I fulfilling this command? Think about it. Am I really? Okay, let's move on to verse 11. Verse 11 says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour, serving the Lord. Perhaps the words zeal and fervour have lost some of their meaning in our contemporary language. Language moves so fast, doesn't it? New words come along at a frantic rate and old words drop out of fashion equally as fast. It's hard to keep up. So at times like this, I find a good dictionary is useful. In fact, I do love a dictionary. So I looked both of these words up in the Oxford Learner's Dictionary. It puts words in quite simple definitions. And here is what it says. Zeal means great enthusiasm or eagerness. Fervour means strong and sincere beliefs. And I'm sorry, I said Oxford Learner's Dictionary, and I see in my slide it says Cambridge Dictionary. It is actually the Cambridge Dictionary. So, anyway, the meanings are there, and that makes it easier for us to understand, doesn't it? So let's look at the verse again in the light of those dictionary definitions. Never be lacking in eager enthusiasm, but keep your strong and sincere beliefs as you serve the Lord. And there's only one problem with that verse. The danger is that we can read it from the perspective that the enthusiasm and passion are something that we have to work up ourselves, whereas actually these things come from letting go of ourselves and from spending more time with God. Because when we draw close to him, through reading our Bibles and through prayer, when we yoke ourselves with Christ and we rest in his love, that's when our spiritual energy is rekindled. That's when our passion grows stronger. Actually, it's 
his enthusiasm and passion, his spiritual fervour that he delights to share with us. And as we come to the end of this section, we start to see that this is also the case with Paul's instructions in verses 12 to 13. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Because after all, how can we have joy when we still live in hope? How can we be patient when we are living in affliction? How can we find the strength to share what we have with our brothers and sisters in need, especially those we don't agree with? How can we go on doing good when they are not being good to us? And the answer, Paul writes in Galatians 6 and verse 9, Let us not become weary of doing good. Let us not become weary of doing good. We understand the instruction, but what if we already have become weary? What if we're already too tired to care? Is it too late? Well, not, a, not at all. Let's be encouraged by Paul's words in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, where he says this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I put the, the verses side by side here. Let us not become weary of doing good, but if we do become weary, and it's understandable, remember, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that concludes Romans 12 verses 9 to 13. Let's move on to the second half of this passage and to my second point today. The evil out there. The evil out there in the world, in our communities, outside of the church. In Romans chapter 12, verses 14 to 21, Paul moves on to talk about how to deal with evil in the community outside the church. And while these words can apply to relationships within the church, this section is primarily concerned with the wider world, the public world, to our relationships within our communities and beyond. Let's read them through with that in mind. Verses 14 to 17. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. This is a major leap from how Jews would have been expected to behave. It's a move away, a big move away from the old eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth approach to something new, a different dynamic. If anyone persecutes you, bless them. How will that go down with the people you encounter out there in the world? Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. That sounds a lot like place sharing to me. We've been looking at place sharing in GCI recently. Celebrating good news with your neighbours, but also being prepared to sit with them, to support them, to weep alongside those who are dealing with tragedy in their lives. And that is a lot of people. A lot of people in our community are dealing with tragedy in their lives. So what impact could that approach have in our communities? Let's continue. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. 
for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Live at peace with everyone. That is quite a challenge. But do you think people would notice you if you behaved that way? Do they? Do you think they would think there's something different about you? And what about this next bit, allowing God to administer justice in the way that he sees best? Well, that is radically different from the world's downward spiral of violence and revenge and more violence and more revenge and so on. And finally, verses 20 to 21. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And even today we find those words challenging. They are so counter to our natural human response to evil, aren't they? Even today, young children are taught by their parents that the best way to stop a bully is to punch him back. It's the way of the world. But I wonder how the communities where those early Roman converts lived reacted to such radically different behaviours as those converts listened to the words of Paul and listened to the Holy Spirit whispering to them and took those instructions on board and acted them out in their lives. I want to read you a quote from Surprise the World by Michael Frost. I was supposed to switch my camera off at that point. Maybe I can do that. Maybe I can't. <laughs> You'll just have to read through my head somehow. Michael Frost says this, while evangelists and apologists such as Peter and Paul were proclaiming the gospel and defending its integrity in an era, in an era of polytheism, and pagan superstition, hundreds of thousands of ordinary believers were infiltrating every part of society and living the kind of questionable lives that evoked curiosity about the Christian message. They surprised the empire with their unlikely lifestyle. Those ordinary believers devoted themselves to sacrificial acts of kindness. They loved their enemies and forgave their persecutors. They cared for the poor and fed the hungry. In the brutality of life under Roman rule, they were the most stunningly different people anyone had ever seen. So no wonder the growth of the early church was so explosive. What did Michael Frost mean when he said that the Roman believers lived the kind of questionable lives that evoked curiosity about the Christian message. He's referring to the words of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 3, verses 15 to 16. 1 Peter 3, verses 15 to 16. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behaviour in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. This is what Michael Frost refers to when he says, living questionable lives, doing surprising things that are counter to how people expect you to behave. And when Peter tells us this, he adds, it will cause people to ask you questions. Perhaps then, that it's within that kind of setting, where Christians bless those who persecute them, rejoice with those who rejoice, 
and sit down and mourn with those who mourn, when Christians do right in the eyes of everyone, perhaps when that happens, people will be prepared to ask them questions, ask them why they're, they're doing the things they're doing, what motivates them to behave like that, and will be prepared to listen to their answers, who will take time to hear them talking about the Lord they serve, the Lord who seemed to let evil conquer him when he died on the cross, but who, in fact, overcame it with the power of his own love and life. So when I asked you at the beginning, who is your favourite superhero? Did any of you say Jesus? Because actually, Jesus is the only person who can help us do the impossible. It's impossible for us, but perfectly possible for him because he is God and all things are possible to God. Jesus overcame the evil of the world with good. Jesus won the victory over sin and death, over the principalities and the powers. Jesus succeeded because he surrendered to the will and the plan of his heavenly Father. And what Jesus did, we can also do, because we have Jesus living in us by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And that's why I chose this picture for my title slide, the picture of a man taking off his outer clothes to reveal the superhero underneath. Except the superhero we have inside us is not Superman or Batman or Wonder Woman. They are not real and they cannot help you. But Jesus can. He is super all right. He is supernatural. And as hard as Paul's commands in Romans chapter 7, verse, sorry, in Romans chapter 12, might seem to us, they are possible because of Jesus. Earlier in Romans, Paul referred to Jesus when he said in Romans 8, 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. But I want to let Jesus have the final word. And Jesus said in John 16, verse 33, I have told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as in many other parts of your holy word, Paul's instructions and commands that we have been looking at today seem impossible to follow, let alone obey. So it is wonderful to understand that only through faith in Jesus Christ and the beautiful work that he did for us are we able to overcome evil with good. Good that is his, not ours. Thank you, Father, that Jesus is the only superhero we will ever need and that he gladly shares his goodness and his salvation with each and every one of us. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And just a reminder that this coming Wednesday evening at 7.30pm, there will be another Bible study in the We Believe series. And you can find the link for that on our website, www.gracecom.church and of course there will be another service here on YouTube at the same time next Sunday. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus that great shepherd of the sheep equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, 
to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen.